<laughs> and we're going guys three seconds nice little intro i am super excited for this week's episode of mlo modern loan officer this is a live recording for our podcast series and today we have a special guest craig black he is actually a licensed appraiser here in our local market and uh craig thanks for thanks for making it today man thanks for having me sir yeah, we are just stoked. And of course, uh, Mr. CK, a.k.a. Mortgage Guru, a.k.a. Kempers, a.k.a. Christian Kemp in the house. Woo! Love to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Oh, 100%. And we have our veteran and mortgage advisor trusted in the market, Casey Carpenter. Thanks for thanks for carving us some time in, Mr. Casey. Yes, absolutely, Addy. For you, anything, brother. Well, and I'm stoked to see that you aren't stuck in your uh, Iraqi <laughs> prison bunker that you chimed in from last week, dude. What? Yeah, I made, I made it out of the darkness. Uh, thankfully, we're back in the light, good light. I don't got uh, plywood surrounding me, so we're ready to rock this week. Oh, my gosh, dude. Like, I watched the pre-live recording of that. We'll put that probably on the channel somewhere if I can bleep out the profanity uh enough but it was hilarious for all those people that didn't catch last week's show which you can see on our facebook live or youtube channels modern loan officers um casey chimed in from a a <laughs> undisclosed bunker undisclosed location uh it looked like he was a prisoner somewhere so check that out it it, it was cracking me up but we made it happen uh last week so getting down to it guys big subject appraisals so keeping in mind everyone home buyers home sellers first time home buyers first time home sellers appraisals are a big piece to the financing of a home loan and we wanted to bring forward craig black who all of us have known and trusted for many many years he's not only a licensed appraiser he's also a licensed real estate agent so he brings forth how many years of experience craig oh geez i think 23 as an appraiser and eight now as a realtor. Oh, just yeah. you know, decades there, guys. So Craig's one of the true professionals and he has just an impeccable reputation for everyone over here in the Pacific Northwest. So we wanted to bring on and dive into quite a few different subject lines. What are the different types of appraisals out there? Uh, specific to loan products, specific to the property type. What's the difference between an appraisal with new construction homes? I mean, the house isn't even done. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Um, what is even the freaking purpose of getting an appraisal? That might be a question for some people. Uh, a good one, which we added to the agenda on our pre-show is how has COVID-19 changed appraisals in the actual physical inspection for people such as Craig and the home? homeowners what are we doing now to adapt to the current pandemic conditions um what changes have appraisers seen from lender requirements so these are all really really good stuff and it's going to naturally evolve throughout the conversation here with just a little bit of structure both casey christian and i are going to dive in with these questions just discussed here so to kick it off, guys, if you have any questions, don't be shy. Throw in the comment. Uh, I know Christian and Casey love it when we get comments from uh, our audience. And it just really, guys, once again, this Modern Loan Officer is a group, uh, a network, a transparent, transparent place to learn and become educated about the real estate market. Um, and this show is just as much for you as for us. So just to kick it off, Craig. Um, can you just walk through what's the purpose of an appraisal? Like, let's just really make it simple and then dive into something a little more complex. Why do we need to get appraisals? Yeah, I like I like that question. Well, that's a lot. There's a lot to unpack there. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the best way I always describe it is particularly if I'm consulting a client for a real estate transaction. I like to stay. I like to say that not only do you have to qualify as a as a borrower for the property, the property has to qualify. So meaning that the property has to appraise for at or above the contract price, which in the current market can be challenging because properties are getting multiple offers and getting bid up above list price. So uh, the lender will typically order a 1004 conventional appraisal, which is a full appraisal 
which will require me to come inside, have a look around, take notes, um, ask the ask the real estate agent what sort of updates there's been. The more information, the better. And then you know we go a little bit further given the market if there's been multiple offers. Um, so yeah, come inside, take a look around, take some pictures, measure, uh, take lots of notes about updates, uh, notes about the neighborhood, uh, look for comparables that would compete if those were simultaneously listed with the property. Uh, you know, so that's kind of quickly the process of the full conventional purchase and refinance appraisal. Yeah. And I, I, I think, you know, bringing back that explanation from you and I might need some help here from Casey and Christian, if we could digest the why we need an appraisal for our listeners here in one to two sentence, what I kind of explain it from a loan officer standpoint is, hey, an appraisal, we are trying to confirm the agreed upon value of the home per the sales contract. And I'm speaking specific to a purchase transaction. So buying a new home, that's the first and foremost, like general blanketed from a distance. Um, Craig, would you agree that's a, would that work for you? Just generally one sentence here? Yeah. That the, that the collateral being financed Mm -hmm. is going to meet or exceed the contract price. Yep. Of, yep. You know, so based on the circumstances of the borrower. Okay. Gotcha. Does that, that sound a little easier to digest? Yeah. We always yeah. just like to, you know, Casey, <laughs> it's like to summarize it back to like, you know, what would you put on a flashcard if you were studying for a test, right? You know, like, what do I need to know? There's no way I could be the expert like Craig in a heartbeat. So, yeah. hey, CK, what would you, uh, what's your input on explaining to uh, refinancing yeah. and buyers? The reason. Yeah, I think, yeah, great. Great question, Addy. Um, so I think it's a value to the uh, clients as well, the borrower. Um, they're going to find out if that uh, purchase that they're about to spend all this money on mm-hmm. is uh, up to that purchase price. Um, everybody wants to make sure they're getting either a good deal or have the value um, for what they're offering on that. So um, Craig, uh, you can talk about this a little bit more about how you come up with those um, values with the comps and everything. Can you dig into that a little bit? And what sure. and what the uh, client gets within that report? Yeah, so what I do typically in my process when I get at a purchase appraisal, let's say it's a uh, ranch home in Beaverton, Mm-hmm. And I have the, the lender always provides the sales contract, any addendums, hopefully those are all provided <laughs> at the onset. Uh, typically not because uh, circumstances that happen, you know, there's repair addendums, there's seller credits that occur after the appraisal is ordered. So the, the transaction is still evolving even after the appraisal has been ordered. But what mm-hmm. I typically do is, if you take the cookie cutter example in Beaverton is I, I typically try to provide two to three or even four sales that have closed within the last three to six months, typically last three months, particularly in a market right now where, you know, the market can be outpacing the comps. We as appraisers mm-hmm. tend to look in the rear view mirror a little bit. And then with your realtor hat on, you're, you're looking at the competition as it exists now and looking forward. But the lender and the underwriters typically want to see three or four closed transactions in the last 30 to 60, 90 days. And then usually they want to see one pending sale and one active listing or a combination of the both. And from there, they typically want the square footage bracketed. They want the updates bracketed. They want the site size bracketed. So, you know, appraisal is not a science. It's it's kind of an art and it's a pretty subjective process. Hey, Greg, what but- is bracketed mean just out of curiosity yeah Yeah. no no i think that's a really good one because guys like i just noted here on the bottom uh two to four comparable recent homes are obtained to Mm -hmm. help determine value but then you name dropped bracket would you mind giving us a little insight on what bracketed means yeah the most important to the lender and the underwriter is to make sure that the square footage of the home is bracketed so you always want a comp that's a little uh, smaller in square footage and one that's a little larger in square footage. So it just gives uh, the, the underwriter this comfort level that you have the property bracketed, not only in terms of size of the gross living area, but even if you have a, you know an unusual home that's on a larger site, they typically want to see a site that's a little larger, one that's a little smaller, 
Uh, you know, if there's a lot of additional site improvements, such as, you know, a large deck, a uh, big covered patio, a shop, if it's, you know, in a, in a rural area, they mm. typically want one or two homes uh, that have similar shops because they want to make sure that whatever contributory value you're providing to those additional site improvements or those other amenities can be supported by another transaction in the area. Okay, that, that makes sense. sense. Mm -hmm. So bracketed is essentially like, you need a well-rounded comparable. So it can't just be like four ultra of the best sales ever seen because that's not a true rounded comparison. Like the four best lots in the neighborhood, like the one that has a pretty good location and a not so great or a little smaller, a little larger to, to kind of round out the evaluation, I guess. Right. And, in, 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 you know, in a, in a different scenario where you don't have a cookie cutter home, when there's a lot of transactions right in the immediate area, you know, you really have to broaden your search criteria, not only with what you're looking for and expanding out even maybe a school district or, you know, if you're looking for something that's on a larger site, you really have to cover some ground and it's not just going to be a, a comparable that's in the typical you know, mile radius, which most lenders want to see. So then there's some additional dialogue and narrative that needs to be included in the appraisal that gives them the comfort level that you found the right ones, even if it's a unique property. And, and Craig, you touched on a point there that I wanted to bring up was the radius of those comparables. Could you touch on that? Um, like, I think you just mentioned about a mile and a half, but uh, is there stuff that's, I mean, it's three miles too far out, five miles too far out. You like to see them around a couple miles. Not at all. You know, in fact, I've done appraisals where comps have been 10, 20, 30 miles away. It just, you know, if it's a, if it's a rural setting or if it's in a small market area where there's just not a lot of data and not a lot of transactions, mm -hmm. you know, you, you really have to expand your search. But when that happens, you definitely have to provide some additional feedback for the, what I like to call the alert reader mm -hmm. of the appraiser or the appraisal uh -huh. to, to, to make them feel comfortable. And then, you know, I always joke that, you know, if I get a complicated one, I'll, I'll respond back to, you know, the lender and just say, hey, we, we might need to discuss, you know, time frame or fee on this because I know that the comparables are going to provide underwriter heartburn, which is, uh -huh. you know, not your not your typical appraisal in the cookie cutter neighborhood where everything's tight and the ranges are, are really tight as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's. It's always, you know, depending on how unique the property is and where it's located. Yeah, those those geographic search uh, parameters can be extended, you know, pretty oh, far. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to know. Great question there, Casey. And I, I actually had I somebody text me on iMessenger here and asked, uh, how does remodeling the home help your appraisal? And I'm glad someone asked this because I get a lot of people being like, oh, well, Zillow or Redfin has me at 385, but you know, I've done all this work to my house. So would you mind explaining in generally speaking how improvements and updates might help or not help your your value? Oh yeah. Well I love that you <laughs> mentioned I love that you mentioned Zillow and Redfin, you know, because that's what people use and it's it's yeah. easy to use and I get it. And quite honestly, uh, I don't know if you know, other appraisers do this, but if I'm if I'm asked to do an, a refi appraisal uh, for a property owner and the home hasn't been listed in a long time and there's no information, there's not a lot of information for me to go on before right. I head out and pull comps, I'll look at Zillow just to see what they say. And you know why? It's because I know that property owner is looking at Zillow too. And mm -hmm. they likely have an idea, or they have something in their mind of, you know, what they feel like the value of their home is. But I will tell you that if it's recent remodel work, Zillow has no idea what you've done inside of your house. No. So, you know, that's why I always feel like our, our value is, you know, a little greater when we, we show up because we get to see and ask questions and talk about them. But yeah, I guess it just depends on the extent of the, of the remodel and where the house is and how large it is and, what room you've remodeled and what types of materials you've used. And then all that considered, hey, are there comps in your neighborhood that you can hang your hat on to know whether or not, you know, you're gonna get dollar for dollar on that remodel. So there's a lot of moving parts to a remodel, yeah. but yeah. You know. 
Are there certain types of the value you can add to a home based on just condition and remodeling? Like say someone puts a million dollars into a $300,000 house. Boom. Is it 1.3 value? Like, no, no way. What, what, no. what type of restrictions to alleviate over evaluations are done from your, from your profession? Good question. I think the best way to know if you're going to get dollar for dollar or even more than that on a remodel is take your existing home, look at comps that are similar to that, and then look at others that have sold mm -hmm. in the last year or two based on the updates that they've done and know whether your neighborhood will support the remodel that you're about to embark on. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Christian, I know you've been through... Um, I, I'd like to chat a little bit about refinancing and appraisals because we're a lot of these are driven home on on purchase thus far. But what are you seeing, Christian, regarding appraisal waivers on refinancing? And sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. I, I can't believe how many more appraisal waivers I've seen in the last year or two. Um, yeah, so give I'm us sure Craig's not happy about this, but yeah, um, <laughs> I think. Uh, Four out of the five refinances uh, closed last month, we had appraisal waivers on. And um, and I believe that's because the loan to value uh, was under 60% with cash out. Um, and the other ones were just rate and term. And I believe that they were limited to like 70% as well. So I know that I've had uh, anything cash out over 70% or 60%. I know that we're requiring a full appraisal um, and I know that every geographical area is different depending on how many cells have been in that area. So Craig could kind of maybe talk about that a little bit as well. And what you're seeing a slow up or speed up, or I know that you've been consistently busy the 18 years I've known you. So, um, you want to, uh, talk about that a little bit, Craig, where you see, gosh, gosh have I known you for 18 years? <laughs> well, yeah, you can go back uh, 18 uh, years. Oh, I remember your name yeah. on those appraisals. Oh, back oh that's at, a back cool name, Craig Black. Yeah. West Coast, West Coast Banks when they West were coming Coast across Bank, my, That's right. When they were coming across my fax machine. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> oh, Big my. old file books. Yeah. Uh, you know, there. I haven't. Well, I never really know what properties get appraisal waivers unless. An appraisal has been ordered, then all of a sudden it's canceled, and I'll I'll ask why, and I'll say, oh well, gotcha. like you said, the down payment is such, or you know, the borrower's credit, uh, or it was a recent purchase, and they're going off of you know some sort of automated system that you know you lenders might use. Um, I I have one today actually, which is interesting. It's a townhome in Beaverton, and it was just purchased in August. And the lender has come back and just asked for an update or a read a certification of value, which is simply I go out, drive by the property to make sure it's still standing, take a couple pictures, briefly look at the comps in the townhome neighborhood, and then write up a little one page summary uh, for, for a much reduced fee, mm. just stating that the property has not decreased in value. It's either remained okay. stable or it has increased. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the property owner who purchased the property in August of 2019 is obviously looking to take advantage of the attractive interest rates. Mm. The lender doesn't require a full appraisal. So they just simply order this modified uh, reader certification of value, which is pretty similar to when, you know, I do appraisal of a new construction. It's not quite complete yet. They send you back out and just ask for an update or a certification that the improvements have been completed based on the plans and specs that were provided. Yeah. Well, yeah. let's talk one thing about, I know that when we're in like a refinance boom, something that the borrower can do before you get there. I know some projects may be incomplete, like maybe a bathroom's in a remodel. Can you tell us a little bit how you need to have a full appraisal accepted as is? Yeah. Well, when there's a, when there's a big chunk of the, the home being remodeled, you know, say the kitchen is under construction or there's a bathroom that's being remodeled and it isn't fully functional, then it mostly becomes the decision of the lender who needs to decide if they want me to do the appraisal subject to, which means mm -hmm. I'll do the appraisal as if that bathroom or that kitchen has been completed. 
and then they'll send me back out to, to ensure that it has been completed and then quickly uh, create a form that lets the lender know and some pictures attached that it is finished. Or if they consider it to be somewhat nominal to the appraised mm -hmm. value, such as, you know, and it will depend on the, in the value and the price point of the home and what the remodel is. But if there's a kitchen that's nearing its completion of a remodel and it's missing some cabinets or a couple doors on the cabinets or a, couple, a small section of flooring, I'll typically suggest that the lender accept the appraisal with a, with a small cost to cure, which is just gotcha. a minor deduction across the board to the comparables. And then if it's you know, a somewhat newer property uh, within the cost approach section of the appraisal, there'll be a minor deduction there. And that's something that allows the lender to move forward with the appraisal, uh, doesn't cause any restriction or the chance of the borrower losing the rate lock if the remodel takes a little bit longer than they thought. So the lender can then move forward. And then I'll simply put a note in there, or add some additional dialogue that, hey, what, what's remaining is nominal to the overall value conclusion, and it shouldn't affect the property's marketability if for some reason, you know, the property was right. taken back and those improvements weren't finished, you know, it's, it's still being considered. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that's important how you talk about dialogue. I think some people just think it's just, you know, figures, numbers, brackets. And, um, yeah, a lot of the, the appraisers are actually kind of showing the map of how they're getting to their value through the dialogue and putting in notes and, and, um, different comps and figures. So I appreciate you uh, touching on that, that side of things too, Craig. I get a lot of home sellers who are like, I really need a vacuum before the appraisal appraiser gets here. Like <laughs> and I try to tell them maybe it'd be great coming from Greg. I try to tell them it's like, they don't care if you haven't dusted the television, like right. those minor things that do you see? Like, I just had a curiosity, like, cause you go visit these homes for now decades. Like, do you see places completely a mess or like over cleaned or people like, I'm just not ready. Can you wait for me to finish? Oh, I'm so glad. Give you us some stories. Me. I haven't talked to anyone in two days. I'm so fired up. <laughs> <laughs> so, yo, you know, it's amazing the stuff that I've seen over the years. And back before I strictly did residential properties, I specialized in multifamily where it was uh -huh. anywhere from 20 apartment units to 600. And, it, and, with a commercial appraisal like that, the lender will dictate how many different apartment units they that you want they want you to go in. Yeah. So you can imagine uh, the what condition of some of those might be. But uh, you know, well to answer your question, I, I you know it's always nice if things are sort of picked up and you can see the finishes of the floors and you know the the kitchen counters and the bathroom counters and that, but. You know, typically most appraisers are just walking through, taking notes on the finishes and the, the overall condition of the interior. You know, we, we can sidestep messes. But a few years ago, I went to go do an appraisal in, in of a townhome in Lake Oswego. Uh -huh. And I knew that it was tenant occupied. I called the, the, the property owner. He said, yeah, just go here on this day, the tenant will be expecting you. Well, then, of course, that's never the case. And the tenant wasn't expecting me. And um, it was a bit of an awkward conversation. I said, it's no problem. I'll come back. And and so I went back to discover that these folks had a sloth in their uh, home, uh, in the cage. And it was all legal. Like there was, a, there was a, at that time, a sloth society in Portland. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, they were I, I didn't know what it was. I just saw this furry little creature hovering on top of a cage in the in the uh, kitchen nook, and oh you know God. the guy the guy uh, calmly just explained that it was a sloth, and they were very active in the sloth community. And so I left. And does it take uh, a long time to get to that meeting? Uh, <laughs> All right. So I, yeah, I, uh, I left there. I called the, I called the property owner to inform him one, that there was a sloth and did he know about it? And two, if he did, did he know that that sloth had been out and about? Because oh, there yeah. were definitely signs that the sloth was not caged at all times. And so that was, uh, that was a first. How even, I, those things really do move in real life. I've never seen one. 
I well, it didn't move when I was there, but it must move. It must <laughs> have been moving. Not, uh, thank God they're not <laughs> operating the DMV. <laughs> well, and what's you know, even to put a cap on that story, I later found out from that property owner that those tenants in that sloth completely destroyed the interior of that beautiful townhome. Oh, right. It had to be completely rebuilt. Yeah, from the from the studs studs in. Oh my so god. It was, that was that's one of my that's one of my favorite stories. And and were, they were nice people and you know, they were just very, you know, into the into their sloth thing. I bet there's and, some other stories too. Oh gosh, yeah. The the, the people what people always ask when you know I love when I go into a home that's just meticulously maintained and it's clean and you know somebody always say, oh I'm sorry I didn't get the kids' rooms picked up and that and I was like, oh you wouldn't believe some of the things that you know I've seen over the yeah, years. Dude, you so. don't have sloth like you're already yeah yeah too. <laughs> <All right. laughs> that's hilarious. Well, I think going in uh, just another question I want to hit is the different types of appraisals for the loan products so going back to our home buyers home sellers like if you're selling a home and you were getting multiple offers you see like one's va one's fha one is conventional how is the appraisal going to be different between the offer that you accept so would you mind kind of I know that's a lot, Craig, but give us some just kind of takeaways on the different types of loan products and how the appraisal is different per that loan product. Well, on a conventional purchase or even on a refinance, depending on the borrower's circumstances and the equity in the property, some lenders will just order an exterior only, which just requires us to drive by, take a few notes of the exterior, uh, typically rely on some old listing information or tax records for our square footages and that. Mm -hmm. So there's no interior inspection of the property. And again, that usually means that the property owner uh, either on a purchase, typically doesn't happen on a purchase, but on a refinance, if they have a certain percentage of equity in the property and their credit's solid and their mm -hmm. you know, other, other write it, underwriting uh, criteria is in check, you know, they'll, they'll allow the appraiser just to simply do an exterior only or a drive by. Uh, there are times, there are times when they will order even a more of a limited product, similar to the one I mentioned earlier, which is a, is a recertification of value, but it's, it's a, even more of an abbreviated version of the exterior only where it's simply, you're just driving by and, and verifying that the property is actually there. And so there's no and comps. Very rare. That's very rare. In Wouldn't fact, you just yeah. do Google Maps or something? Satellite version? Yeah, no. I mean, they they will typically pay you for your time to drive by and, uh, and make and make sure it's there, and then fill out a form. But I think those have lost the way in favor of the property inspection waivers. Those usually were a product where, you know, it, it just didn't require a lot from the appraiser. And I have a feeling that some of the automated systems that lenders are are using now are yeah, allowing these uh, appraisal inspection waivers to occur. But, um, you know, the the difference between a FHA and VA appraisal versus a conventional appraisal is that, that FHA and HUD and the VA are a little more particular when it comes to the condition of the property, if there's any uh, repairs or health safety or structural issues that the appraiser might be able to identify. Uh, the, other, the other big piece to FHA and VA appraisals, and also some of the rural housing or USDA appraisals, is that the lender wants the appraiser to peek in, do a head and shoulders inspection of the attic and crawl space. Oh. And so I always make sure that the property owner or the real estate agent knows, particularly right now during the COVID uh, pandemic yeah. situation that has occurred and mm -hmm. has impacted the appraisal situation. Uh, to you know, make sure that those areas are clear so that I can get to them and you know drop down in there a bit and take a picture and you know they're typically yeah, just or in there like I, like I'm sure you got some stories about the crawl spaces and stuff but I think one of the biggest things is like hey if you got to access underground or an attic because of FHA or VA what are things that you're looking for and what do because I know it's evident everyone's best interest I think that's one of the mis perceptions of an appraisal is like everyone wants this like especially fha and va people want you to get into a good home so you're a part right. of the process of making that happen so what are you looking for when you're diving 
deeper under the hood, I guess we'll call it. Well, right. Yeah. I mean, there's, you're only going to get so much. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing is any standing water. I think FHA and BA are pretty particular about making sure that there's a vapor barrier there and there's not a lot of exposed dirt. And uh, so rodent rodents, obviously, uh, an appraisal buddy of mine say that he tore back the crawl space hut hatch one day and there was a raccoon face up dead staring yeah. at him. So it, that, yeah. that was cause for alarm quickly, <laughs> but you know, and then the attic too, similar, you know, any, any signs of, you know, water dam water damage or even fire damage on the trusses, uh, making sure that there's adequate insulation up there. I mean, they, these, you know, government agencies aren't requiring us to do do a full walkthrough or go, you know, the complete, you know, area of the crawl space, but just enough to be able to get a good sense of what the con what the conditions are in those areas. Mm -hmm. No, so, that yeah, I, makes sense. I know, like on a conventional Craig, like I had an appraisal come back recently that was calling out a lot of repairs, and it was even a conventional loan, which mm -hmm. is rare the stigma or the reputation of people who aren't appraisers is conventional is a lot easier. However, I'm starting to see, especially during COVID-19, um, appraisers getting quite a bit more meticulous on how they want things seen in regards to condition of the property. Um, any remarks on that? Not really. I, I don't know if I don't know if that's just because some appraisers are just doing exterior onlys now and they're taking uh -huh. more time to really, you know, dissect the exterior of the property. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, or they, or we, you know, the other appraisers feel like lenders now are scrutinizing the appraisals a little more. And I can surely attest to that. Uh -huh. uh, I can, I can tell you that uh, about one out of every five appraisals that I do right now, are getting through on the first attempt, whether that's, you know, an addendum that's being created after I've already inspected the property right. or, uh, you know, there's another comp that needs to be considered um, or, you know, there's just some additional information that wasn't available, such as if it's a condo, making sure that, you know, the HO, the monthly HOA fees are correct, that there wasn't any special assessments. And, and sometimes that's tricky on a, on a refi for a condo is, is some mm -hmm. folks, what, you know, if it's owner occupied or if it's tenant occupied, they're not even certain what their HOA fee because it's right. is because it's automatically deducted from their account and they haven't paid attention. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of those items come back, uh, whether a property is in a PUD or not, or it once was, those are things that pop up that underwriters see on title reports. Um, Addison, as you may recall, me interviewing you about the underground train in North Portland that I was not aware of and, sure. you know, had a property owner contact me after, you know, there, it was a VA purchase actually. And I must have interviewed 70 or 80 realtors and maybe 20 different appraisers and asked them if they knew about this underground train. And I can tell you it was less than 1%. Oh. So. Wow. Those types of things, those types of things that come up that you, you're not aware of, whether they're visible or not. But yeah, I do believe that underwriters and other lenders are are really reading these appraisals more thoroughly now, given you know the unemployment in the country and and the, sure. what how this pandemic has affected people people's circumstances and and their financial situation. Yeah. Uh, and, and Craig, I just wanted to touch base on one part of that on the VA for all my veterans out there that are listening. Uh, not anyone can just do a VA appraisal, correct? Right. Yeah. The VA has their own panel and those appraisals are assigned every Monday. And depending on uh, the appraisals, the appraiser's ability to handle two or three of them the mo uh, a month or every couple of weeks, you know, depending on how what they want their volume to be. I typically will only... I will only take one every week because oftentimes the the appraisals I, I've signed up for several counties in and around our area. So a lot of times these appraisals, I have one I have to go see in the next week that's in Clatskan and that's not an easy get for me, but I signed up for Columbia County. So if you sign up for Columbia County, you get all of Columbia County, not just uh -huh. Scappoose. You get to go to Bernonia and Clatskan and some of those other areas that, you know, are a longer drive, but yeah, the, the VA has their own panel. Uh, two or three years ago, actually, it might be longer than that. They really 
didn't have enough appraisers to cover cover the ground. 2016, and, probably. Yeah, and I sort of felt that it was my duty to get on their panel because my dad was in the service, and I, I felt like it was the right thing to do. And and there was a lot of demand. And the VA contacted me and said, "We we really need you, and we really need you to cover some ground." And so that's what happened. But yeah, it's it's they have their own panel. They are assigned every Monday through their portal. And then typically, if it's a purchase or a refi, you're contacted by that particular lender that's going to fulfill that VA loan. And any you know uh, information that you need, you, they have you know there's usually a loan officer or a, or a loan processor. But yeah, there there's a, there's still a shortage in certain states. They they have a really hard time getting them placed. And I know even around here when it's a unique property and it's on the outskirts I, very often i know that there's they're still struggling struggling to get you know the right guy right guy or gal to to get there for them but, yeah uh, Casey, i'm really glad that you brought that up and for the the first time home buyer or even home buyer seller that doesn't know the VA loan is a little bit different in the sense that it's the only appraisal from a loan officer standpoint that we don't order it to an appraisal management company or a company appraisal department. The VA, as Craig noted before, manages the entire ordering, scheduling, and communication for VA approved appraisers. And I just learned, I mean, in five years, I didn't know this, the VA assigns them on Mondays. So that actually helps me because then yeah. I can do every time. I'm going to name drop that to agents now. I go, like, oh, well, you know, they, they get ordered on Monday. So, you know. Yeah. And, and, and the VA, the VA is, they're very strict about the mm -hmm. communication process and making sure that these veterans are uh, taken care of in a timely manner. They, mm -hmm. when they order now, now that they order them on Mondays, I, I think they're getting a little more strict now about updating uh, the portal on when you have the the inspection, the property inspection set with the veteran. Uh, they require that the appraisal be back in 10 business days. Every every area of the country is different based on their turn time. Mm -hmm. uh, but here in the Portland metro area, it's 10 business days. If you're not delivering by 10 business days, you're going to get a nasty gram or email or, you know, uh, one of their staffers letting you know that you're going to have something put in your file and the fees are also set too and uh, the fees are the fees are established by the va based on i, I don't know what i'll say what their criteria is uh likely just based on volume and um but the 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 fees for uh, a detached residence condo duplex, any plex properties, those are all, those are all dictated by the VA, not the actual lender. Oh, that's huge, right, Casey? I mean, like, I think, you know, a few years ago, I believe it was like 17 or 18, the VA started making huge adjustments to the turn time expectations and obligations for the VA approved appraiser, because there was this whole stigma that they take forever and this and that and that. And the VA is really going to bat for the veterans, right, Casey? Yeah, definitely, Addy. You hit it right on the head. I mean, we saw those changes. Obviously, 16 was, it wasn't a fun go around for appraisers and, and VA loans and stuff. There just wasn't enough. I'm glad, uh, Craig, you, you stepped up uh, and said, hey, I want to be part of this. I want to help veterans. So that's a big, big deal. I mean, like you said, there's still a shortage um, of appraise, you know, VA home loans, you know, needing appraisers out there to, to appraise those. So thank you, Craig. Yeah, you know the other thing that I might mention too is in these in these multiple multiple offer situations that occur, particularly when uh, you know properties are being bid up and they're going over list price. And I I, I honestly haven't done a purchase appraisal, whether it's been uh, a VA appraisal, FHA, or conventional in the last probably thirty to forty five days that hasn't had multiple offers. The market is just booming, and you know, the one thing that I can say on behalf of the VA is they do really, really look out for their veterans and the borrowers. And these veterans also need places to live too. You know, they also want to compete for these properties, you know, in this, in this uh, multi offer scenario. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of realtors will advise their property owners about being cautious of, of accepting a VA offer 
But the one thing that I can say is that if they do, and I just encountered one that was a multiple offer situation in the Alberta area, it was a very desirable property. Uh, the gal who owned the property was elderly and her husband had been a veteran and she accepted the veteran's offer that wasn't the highest offer, but it meant something to her. And, you know, I would say that you know, the one thing that you can count on is that the VA is going to do their best to make sure that that appraisal is back in a timely manner. And, you know, Casey, I don't know if you've encountered this either, but the other great thing that the VA does on behalf of the veteran borrowers is if there's a chance that the appraisal is going to come in below the contract price, the appraiser has to invoke what they call the Tidewater Act, which then gives the realtor a chance to provide additional comparables to support that contract price for the veteran. And I think that's great because here you have a listing agent that's been, you know, spent intimate time with the property, 30, 60, 90 days, sometimes depending on how long it's taken the marketing, you know, to occur, they know that property really well. And there might be comparables that the appraiser doesn't know that he's missing. And yeah, they do take steps to make sure that, you know, the, the appraisal is accurate. And, you know, at that point in time, uh, usually, you know, if, if there's not enough comparables available, then I know that the, the VA will really work hard with the appraiser to, you know, you know, obviously they want to make sure that the appraisal, you know, is the right, is the correct value. They don't want to, they don't want a veteran overpaying. And if it's not there, it's not there, but they do take extra steps to ensure that, Hey, we do have the right comparables and we're doing our best to get this veteran in this property. Even if, even if it is a multi-offer situation, it's go, it's gone above list price. That is a huge key piece of information, Craig, that you just dropped right there. And I, I appreciate that because that is something yeah. I think most people aren't aware of. Um, yeah. I have seen that happen one time on, on one loan, with a VA loan with mine. But yeah, thanks for bringing that up because that is huge. If it does or if it looks like it may come in under value, mm -hmm. it's really nice to hear that the VA has these extra steps allowing you know, what you just talked about to take place. Right. It's big. I mean, I see offers not i mean it just happened over the weekend it was a va offer with um an escalation clause which means they're willing to match whatever other offers are hit on the home and they still didn't win the deal and it's freaking ridiculous like um so those little points actually do really help because people like me who will call and be an advocate for the va product casey christian we all do this call on sundays and the offer be like hey mr seller uh, selling agent. We have a great opportunity here. This is a pre-approved client, pre-underwritten, whatever it is. And I can drop those things, Monday orders, 10 business days, the Tidewater Act, pre, uh, mm -hmm. allowing for an agent to, you know, resubmit a, a, a higher consideration of value if it happens. And um, I think we're slowly getting there, at least on our market on VA, but those are things that really help us. And other loan officers who, you know, chime in on this stuff, um, good takeaway. So hopefully no matter what company you're at, if you're a buyer, seller, loan officer, agent, please, 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 please take note. Um, and don't just subscribe to rumor. Like I see that so much in this industry on loan product. Like, oh, well, I heard, you know, X and X loans don't close for 120 days. It's like, you don't even know what you're talking about. Dude. Well, you know? uh Addison, I was going to say too, a lot of, a lot of listing agents, you know, that I've encountered just being on the realtor side of things, or if I had, you know, had represented a, a veteran on the, on a purchase and representing them as their buyer, buyer's agent, mm -hmm. uh, very often they look at these, the, the VA buyer and say, oh, well, they, you know, don't have as much earnest money down, less skin in the game. They also feel like the VA, if it's a property that needs, um, it has a little bit of deferred maintenance or, you know, there's some, some repairs that are going on that, you know, that the VA isn't going to do their part to, you know, participate and, you know, help assisting this veteran to get through this. And I can tell you that the VA and the FHA, are, you know, aren't as strict as what the perceptions might indicate when it comes to repairs. I mean, there's the old peeling paint and those sorts of items and that, but, you know, again, uh, with those properties that I have appraised as for the VA. And if there's ever a situation where, you know, obviously if there's health safety or structural issues, those have to be pointed out, but 
you know, if, if it's nominal repairs and if it's not impacting, it will impact the marketability down the road. You know, it, it, it's not quite as strict as some folks might think. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. And I'm really glad you brought that up. So great little section there. Casey chiming in on the VA loan, looking out for our people. So I look out for the vets and like, and Craig, thank you for for doing it. You're welcome. Pro vet. And I think kind of transitioning here to the fourth quarter of our conversation, this has been a great talk. I'm sure we're going to get a ton of, uh, listens and views and post comments, but I wanted to dive in before we run out of time, new construction, because you had mentioned, you know, you do new construction appraisal. So guys, the house isn't even built. Craig, how are you even going to appraise it? So how are you appraising it? Yeah. So they normally, if it's just a lot, I'll be provided with plans and specs and the, there'll be typically reduced plans that come from the lender. There'll be a construction budget. Uh, hopefully there is enough information to go through and know what was paid for the lot. So yeah, it's, you know, it's, you're basically appraising the property, assuming that it's already there and it's already built and you take your square footages and, and your specifications on the finishes and plug those right in. And, and hopefully it's, hopefully it's in a a development that's already got uh, new construction and there's some recent comps and it makes it, pretty simple. I, I actually prefer it because I love to sort of dive in to see, you know, what's going to be there. And, and uh, it saves me from having to measure the house and make a <laughs> sketch. I can usually just plop the architectural plans right in and, and just state that, you know, the appraisal is subject to the the plans and specs that were provided. And then, you know, once the home's finished, the lender will typically send you back to do a quick walkthrough to make sure all the finishes were similar to what you included in the appraisal. And, and uh, submit a little form on top of what you've already provided. And there you go. Craig, and who's providing you that piece of information, the permits, the plans, the specs? Yeah, it usually comes, it usually comes from the appraisal department. Uh, I have done several that have uh, been ordered by Umqua Bank Mm -hmm. and Umqua works with a lot of larger track builders and custom home builders. And usually those will be in an established development where there's, you know, already uh, homes that have been built, homes that have sold. So they'll provide the construction budget. They'll provide the plans and specs. And yeah, that usually that usually comes directly from either the lender that has their own in-house appraisal department. Or if it happens to be a lender that uses an appraisal management company, it will come directly from them. Gotcha. No, yeah. And both Casey and Christian have worked over their careers with new construction on site as preferred lenders, builders, lenders. So Christian, uh, what questions would you have specific maybe to the final inspection of a construction and how construction appraisal and how that can actually affect the closing date? Because I've heard some horror stories with Mm-hmm. Just some of the littlest things preventing that final sign off and stopping people from moving into their brand yeah. new. Yeah, Addison. Uh, I think everybody's heard of the OC letter, occupancy letter is huge um, in the final transaction of a new construction uh, project. It could be a remodel, or, uh, you know, we have some uh, construction programs out there for refinances as well. So, the occupancy letter allows you to get that final sign off from the inspector saying that it's uh, free from any safety and sound issues. And um, that is everybody is holding on to pins and needles because we're, we're up against lock dates and everything else. And I, I would say that was the main part that, you know, was huge. What, what do you think, Casey? Yeah. Uh, the COO is a big one, but the two big things I always want to touch on, I'm sure Craig can attest to this is, Final sales price addendum. What's that final sales price? Were they adding upgrades during this transaction since Craig went out there and looked at it? I'm sure they were. I'm sure they went to the design center, saw that nice granite. They wanted it. (laughs) So final sales price addendum. And then any other addendums maybe we didn't have. New construction. I mean, you can have the regular real estate contract. The builders got their own contract. They got their own addendums. I mean, I'm sure you can attest, Craig, uh, for when we're sending you out there, we want to make sure you have every other additional piece of information that may have come along since you've been out there the first time. 
Yeah, not only the documentation, but you'll get all sorts of stories as to whether the home is finished and if it's not finished, you know, and I always try to make sure that at least a couple calls because it's typically uh, the builder that says it's done or the listing agent says it's done. But the best call is always to the if there's an agent that's representing the buyer of that home to say, hey, uh, you know, what's what's the status here? And I would say 75 to 80 percent of the time on new construction, I get there and it's not finished. Yeah. And when I say not finished, I mean, there's like the kitchen isn't finished or the bathrooms aren't finished. Uh, you know, it's not you know, if there, again, if it's something that is uh, super nominal and, you know, you can basically state that it doesn't have a huge impact to the overall value. Like, hey, if there's, you know, some hardware missing from the kitchen cabinets or, you know, there's. Uh, a toilet needs to be placed, something like that. You know, usually it's not going to require me to make a second trip to, you know, verify that that's been completed. The lender is, you know, going to be okay with it as long as, you know, we we state that, you know, it doesn't have a huge impact to the overall value or, you know, it's not going to affect its marketability. But yeah, the, the documentation, you know, if there's been updates, if there's ever been, if there's been any seller credits, you know, like like that's the big one. Uh, but again, updates and and just in, just trying to verify if the property is actually complete or not. Yeah, there's and, so many you know, addendums going back and forth too. You know, through the transaction of a new construction. So I'm sure getting A to Z, you know, and all the addendums is huge for you. I've rare, I've rarely been asked to verify if the certificate of occupancy has been issued. Only only a couple different times in the last few years. I think that's more of a a lender requirement right. ensuring that but i have been asked a couple different times if if i know or if i've been provided that and some lenders will actually send it to me and i'll just add a statement in that final paperwork stating that it has been provided and it was issued wow that's this is all really good input i mean in under an hour guys we've covered you know what's going on with appraisals what's the difference between appraisals for the loan product and the property type. So FHA, VA, conventional being some of the top most commonly used loan products. How are those evaluated different? And perhaps maybe from this conversation, we're all learning that it is imperative to give all loan products an opportunity because in the end, everybody wants the purchaser to get into the home, whether it's VA, and I loved hearing those like step falls on um, how VA continues to push to make it a competitive product in the eyes of home sellers. That was such great input there. Um, the new construction and the importance and some of the miscommunication of who you're talking to and is the house done, is it not, have there been upgrades and have those been communicated with the appraiser? So really just fantastic input. And I think I'd like to kind of conclude in the final question is, um, you know, we had had some, uh, an episode a few weeks uh, over a month ago with an appraisal representative talking about appraisals going digital, like using drones and geo mapping and the, the homeowner actually using their own video. Like Craig, what do you think? And I'm not trying to scare you out of your part of your career here, but like if you could fast forward 30 years in the eyeballs of Elon Musk, are we doing, are we doing appraisals or what? Well, I think, I think lenders have been trying to push appraisers out for quite some time in, in, right. in a way of automation. Uh, they've been asking for what was called a bifurcated appraisal, which is kind of a, having somebody else in the field and then provide that information back to the appraiser, which I don't feel comfortable with at all. I wouldn't want, you know, somebody providing me with information that I hadn't seen. But I will tell you that the COVID-19 circumstances have uh, opened lenders' eyes to making sure that they understand that the appraiser is the eyes and ears out there now. Mm -hmm. And they've been, they've been trying to order abbreviated and modified appraisal products, but a lot of lenders are still requiring these interior inspections of properties, even if they're you know, on purchases and refis. So it's it's sort of good news for the appraiser in some regards, because here we are now able to prove to these lenders that we're still, you know, a viable piece out in the field, you know, telling the story about what's happening there, particularly with 
you know, the number of refis that are occurring on top of, you know, the unemployment that's happening. So I don't see that happening for a bit because I think the world is going to be changed uh, for a while. And it's also going to impact the appraisers and making sure that, you know, there again, or the eyes and ears of the lender out there still. And I, I just don't see that happening anytime soon. In fact, the VA, going back to the VA, and I'll tie, tie this up, the VA now, some lenders actually require me to check the box to state that I am not going to be using anybody else to obtain my on-site information, mm. such as these bifurcated appraisals, that I'm going to be responsible for visiting the property, seeing it, taking down all the information. And if I had plans to complete the appraisal in that way, I suspect that appraisal would be pulled from me. Wow. So again, another another wow. another benefit to the VA appraisal process. Boom. And you know, Christian Casey, I feel like I've gotten like two or three such good takeaways that are gonna help me get yeah. our home buyers into contract. So Craig, we truly appreciate the insight, man. I feel like there needs to be a part two here once you yeah, end your industry. So um, thank you so much for taking the time to join in on MLO, the Modern Loan Officer, uh, a space where home buyers, home sellers, and industry professionals can transparently discuss ways to navigate through an ever so evolving industry. Um, so thank you again, Craig. We truly do appreciate it. My pleasure, Addison. Thanks for having me. Oh uh, yeah, without a doubt, and we'll we'll definitely keep in touch. Um, guys, like this is big stuff. I'm super stoked yeah. about today. Um, uh, Craig was just some freaking awesome, awesome insight. Uh, oh God, just such valuable pieces he was giving us there. Like you said, yeah, I mean, we, we as loan officers, I mean, now have some additional, uh, ammunition to go out there and talk about, especially backing up our VA and our veterans. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm fired up. Yeah. I'm fired up. Great ammo. I really hope that our listeners take away and listen to this episode wholeheartedly and especially the sellers. I mean, there's so much information and misperception and it was great to hear from Craig and um, awesome input Christian for the new construction and the refinance. Uh, awesome, awesome takeaways there. And uh, of course, Casey coming in strong for our veterans home slice. I'm going to go sardines on the screen for you. Thank you so much. Represent everybody straighten it up, straighten it up, straighten it up. Yes, uh, for all you listeners out there, we're toggling with the live stream on Facebook. Once again, this is Addy Net with MLO, the full team action pack. We are so excited with the growth that we're having, bringing you industry professionals, transparent information, and a space for you to learn about the real estate industry. So till next time, we'll catch you all. Subscribe, listen, comment. We're here for you and we're here for the people. So y'all have a good time and we'll catch you on Friday.